It was here, along the very banks of the mighty Nile River, that the ancient Egyptians developed their remarkable culture. All about are those wonders that have made Egypt what it is today, and what it has always been. The great lure, the magnet, that has attracted scholars and travelers over the endless centuries. It's not strange that today, we know so much of what they did and how they did it. Amazingly, the records are still here. Their written language of hieroglyphics has been deciphered and can be read. History inscribed on the walls of their temples. Exploits of the mighty pharaohs etched into their huge columns. And a parade of their gods carved into their soaring... Aswan lies some 650 miles south of Cairo, a picturesque area possessed of a healthful climate. This setting is first of the great Nile cataracts, the result perhaps of some prehistoric cataclysm that spewed forth the gigantic granite boulders that virtually blocked the river. This was the southern boundary of Pharaoh's kingdom, for his mammoth barges and ships of state couldn't get past this great natural barrier. Many of the pharaohs left their names carved into the granite boulders, their cartouches, as they're called. All about Aswan today is left by pharaoh's stonemasons, for nearby are the granite quarries where the kings of ancient Egypt obtained their tremendous. Still lying in its quarry bed, left unfinished, is a giant of an obelisk, 92 feet in length and measuring 10 and a half feet across at its base. South of Aswan lies the ancient land of Nubia, a vast, inhospitable territory of sandy wastes interspersed with jagged, sheer cliffs and pyramid-shaped mountains. In this unlikely setting stands one of ancient Egypt's most impressive monuments, the Great Temple of Abu Simbel. Hewn directly into the living rock of the mountain, each of the immense figures is 65 feet in height, an amazing spectacle to look upon. The statues represent the king who fashioned the temple, Ramesses II. Today, we can actually look upon the face of this mighty pharaoh. Thanks to the incredible magic performed by the ancient Egyptian embalmers, here, before our very eyes, is the mummy, the preserved body of Ramesses II, who ruled Egypt 3,000 200 years ago. Modern Luxor lies some 450 miles south of Cairo. This site has been the goal of historians, archaeologists, and travelers for thousands of years. For here once stood magnificent Thebes, whose temples were the mightiest ever erected by human hands. When Thebes was the capital of ancient Egypt, the temple of Karnak was the country's most grandiose sanctuary. Almost every pharaoh of any note whatsoever had a hand in its building, a construction project that extended over a period of 2,000 years. Just imagine, when the great pylon, or entrance, was erected, the avenue of rams that leads to it was already 600 years old. Over there, on the other side of the sacred lake, are the remains of a building that's been a source of wonderment for all who have ever seen it. A marvel of engineering, the great hypostyle hall. These are man's mightiest columns, averaging 65 feet in height and measuring 33 feet in circumference. And up at the top, their capitals are so large, a hundred men could stand on them. Surely building on a simply gigantic scale. This was the work of King Seti I, and on the northern enclosure of his great hall is a huge relief that shows the king and his army battling his enemies, the Libyans. There's the king, with his enemy's hair grasped in his hand, and over here the great god Ammon, to whom he's presenting these terrified captives. And here is the miraculously preserved body of the king himself, Seti I who built the hypostyle hall, who conquered the Libyans. Seti, whose dignity and noble bearing are still evident, 
after the passage of 33 centuries. Not far from Karnak stands the Temple of Luxor, as we call it today. The pylon, which formed the entrance to an Egyptian temple, and the obelisk were erected by Ramesses II. The inscriptions which glorify the king also tell us he dedicated his temple to the great god Amun. Here in hieroglyphics is the king's name. And over there is one of six colossal statues that once stood in front of the temple. The boy king Tutankhamun was responsible for the beautiful columns that form the central part of the temple. And notice how the capitals flare out at the top. They represent an open lotus flower. Over here, in the court of Amenhotep III, is the other style of capital used by Egyptian architects the motif being a closed lotus bud. This temple and Karnak are each on the east bank of the Nile. On the other side of the river, that vast plain extends westward until it ends abruptly in a wall of massive sandstone cliffs. Here on the western plain, these four huge but headless statues regally announce that we're at the mortuary temple of Ramesses II. These were not tombs, but places where the spirit of the departed pharaoh was worshipped. There is some of the original coloring, almost as vivid and beautiful as the day it was painted. Remember the great temple he carved from rock at Abu Simbel? Well, there's something here that's equally astounding. Just look at the remains of that fallen and broken giant. Here's what's left of a seated figure of the pharaoh, carved from a single piece of Aswan granite over 60 feet in height. And think about this. Today, with all our mechanical skills, we have the greatest difficulty in moving and putting into position an object of 200 tons. This statue weighed over 800 tons. Probably no two statues in the world are more famous than these. The Greeks called them the Colossi of Memnon. And this one was very famous in ancient times, for each morning it emitted loud and frightening cries. The answer, though, was simple. The heat of the rising sun, striking the stones after they had cooled all night, caused the blocks to expand and rub against one another. This produced the sounds that terrified the natives. But after the Romans came here and repaired the image, the cries stopped. In this wild and desolate place, many of Egypt's greatest pharaohs found their final resting place, the Valley of the Tombs of the Kings. On the other side of that monstrous wall of rock, a world of life and vegetation. But here, within this valley, there's not a scrub, not a blade of grass, just the overpowering heat, sun-blistered stone, a great silence and the tombs. There's nothing like this to be found anywhere else in the world. And everyone who comes to this fascinating valley seeks out one tomb in particular. When this tomb was discovered in 1922 by Lord Carnarvon and Howard Carter, it created a worldwide sensation. It was the archaeological discovery of all time. For the first time, the tomb of an Egyptian pharaoh had been found intact. We're about to enter the tomb of the boy King Tutankhamun, a lad of but nine when he came to the throne and only 18 when he died. There on the wall, Tutankhamun can be seen making offerings to the gods. And within the pink granite sarcophagus lies a golden coffin. The Egyptian authorities have done a wonderful thing. They could have put the young king's body on display, but they didn't. It still lies within this coffin, so Tutankhamun can continue to rest here in peace, in his own coffin, in his own tomb, with some of his golden splendor. All those ancient and wondrous achievements would have been impossible without the Nile. It was, as it still is today, a watery highway that links north with south, 
and it offers the cheapest and most convenient means of transportation as well. Since ancient times, a network of canals has channeled the river's life-giving waters to more remote farming areas. This site today is one that young Tutankhamun would be perfectly familiar with. And there's a device still being used today he would recognize equally as well. To raise water from one level to a higher one, what could be simpler than a shadoof? A bucket on one end of a pole and a counterweight on the other. Elemental mechanics. If Ramesses could return today, he'd find an implement still being employed with which he'd be familiar. A sakya, a water wheel. Around and around it goes. The oxen are remote descendants of the animals, and the boy the remote descendant of the men, who for thousands of years have drawn up the life-giving waters of the Great River, perhaps from this very same place. All. Everything depends upon the Nile. Each year, the river overflows its banks. And for a period of about three months, all this is underwater. Then when the waters recede, they leave a rich deposit of sediment. To reason, this narrow valley has been one of the most fertile areas in the world. Wheat, corn, maize, oats, barley, other things grow here in abundance. Two crops a year, often three, so rich is the soil. All about are scenes that could come straight from tomb walls. For thousands of years, the methods have remained the same. Only the people using them have changed. At a site called Giza, just 15 miles west of Cairo, are those monuments that have become synonymous with the very word Egypt, the Sphinx and the Pyramid. Despite all the ingenious theories and the ludicrous conjectures, these pyramids were erected for one purpose only, to preserve and protect the bodies of the pharaohs. Regardless of their size, they were tombs, and they had no other significance. There's an estimated 60 million cubic feet of stone in the pyramid tomb of the pharaoh Khafra, whom the Greeks called Kephren. Up at the top, some of the original limestone casing can still be seen. The Sphinx is an image of Khafra, and it pictures him with the body of a lion, which to the ancient Egyptians denoted great strength. The body was carved from a single outcropping of rock, but the four legs and curving tail were constructed of masonry. Just imagine how it must have looked in all its glory, all its color, must have been an awe-inspiring sight, and it still is. But now, all else pales into insignificance. For here is the first wonder of the world, a man-made mountain of stone so immense, its base alone covers more than 13 acres. This is the Great Pyramid, the tomb of the pharaoh Khufu, whom the Greek historians called Cheops. Now let's climb to the summit of this mountain. It was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and today it is the only one that remains. These great blocks were placed here by the workmen almost 5,000 years ago. Imagine, 2,300,000 blocks of stone, weighing an average of two and a half tons each. Seven million tons of stone. There's enough stone here to build a highway one foot thick and 18 feet wide from New York to San Francisco. Photographs from below, we look like ants scrambling up a rock pile. Higher and higher we climb. We don't dare make a slip. 400 feet. 450 feet ever higher, and then finally, the summit, a height equal to that of a 40-story building. Looking to the west, we see the endless sands of the Sahara Desert. To the east, the lush green valley, the gift of the Nile. From here, atop man's greatest single monument, 
we can look down upon Egypt and its 5,000 years of fabulous history.